My name is Shelley Wright. This really happened at the Royal United Hospital Bath in the UK on the 13th of November 2017. This series of letters were part of my post-traumatic stress disorder therapy to help process the events of that day and what has happened since. It shows that it is not just a traumatic event that is important but how things are handled afterwards and how recovery may be impeded. I'm hoping that they can be used as a training aid for psychologists, mental health students, healthcare workers and anyone involved in critical incidents. Healthcare workers, do not let this happen again. Listen to your patients. This letter was started on the 13th of November 2018, a year after the event. To Nurse D. A year ago today I was a patient on B32 waiting to go for my hysterectomy. You may remember that I started to bleed PV and asked for your help which was not forthcoming. A while later I had a cardiac arrest in theatre from my blood loss. One year later my life is still totally blighted by this event and as you were not present at either of my two complaints meetings so I could let you know how it felt and still feels to be so badly let down. I was very relaxed about the surgery. I knew it had to go ahead and had no reservations. I felt comfortable with the anaesthetist, Dr K, who I had seen first thing. I spent the morning reading and when I thought I would be called to theatre I went to the toilet. When I sat down I suddenly started to bleed PV. I had previous problems bleeding and had been on tranexamic acid which had stopped it. I also knew that the bleeding point was internal and could only be stopped with tran tranexamic acid and quick surgical intervention. I sat very still on the toilet hoping that the bleeding would stop. There was a constant drip and I soon realised that I was going to be in trouble without quick intervention. The toilet was now by now full of blood and I had filled the yellow bin with bloody tissues. I slowly walked to the nurse's station to alert you. You and all your colleagues, at least four, heard me say, I'm bleeding badly. Although all of you were sat down with paperwork, you were the only one who bothered to move. None of you were busy and there were only three patients left in the department. You gave me a large green incontinence pad and put me in one of the rooms. Although it was the one closest to the nurses station, the door looked out onto the other patients and I was not visible to the nurses station. Why would you put me there when I had just alerted you that I was bleeding badly? Deteriorating patients need to be observed. This is just basic nursing knowledge whether you are the first day on the job or after 40 years of experience that you had. I then expected you to do a set of observations and escalate me. To my horror, you went off and cleaned the toilet. Why would you think it was more important to clean the toilet than to care for one of your patients? Any one of your colleagues could have done the cleaning. I looked at the clock. It took you five minutes to clean all the blood. You flushed the toilet three times and scrubbed in between. How could you not realise that you had the start of an emergency with all of that blood? I sat there absolutely terrified. I sat as still as I could, trying to keep my respiration and pulse rate down. It felt as if I was in a training film and I was waiting for someone to push the pause button and say what should, what should be happening here. I was not just a patient having my first operation in 35 years. I was a hugely experienced A&E nurse with lots of surgical theatery, theatre recovery and theatre admissions ward experience. I knew this was just not right. I was not out in a public place asking a random member of public for help. I was on a ward where I should have been safe, but I was not. Can you imagine how it felt? I'd had my haemoglobin checked the day before and it was already down to 92, so I knew I could not afford to much more of a drop before I ran into trouble. Emergencies do not happen in emergency departments, intensive care, coronary care, because the staff are anticipating them. Emergencies happen on units where staff are complacent and think they only have safe well patients and where they think they know better than their patients. When you came into the room, I immediately asked you to escalate me. 
You said that I needed to be in theatre, that this was the best place for me, but you did nothing to get me there. All this time I was constantly dripping onto the pad. You went away and then came back on another two occasions. Each time I asked you to escalate me and you didn't. You did no observations and you did not check my blood loss. What will eventually happen if you do nothing about a hemorrhage? You don't have to be a nurse to answer that. If you do nothing, your patient will have a PEA cardiac arrest. All PEA cardiac arrests are preventable if identified and dealt with correctly. I knew what was going to happen to me. I was sitting silently and terrified. You obviously and had not looked at my notes as it was clearly written on the front of my anaesthetic chart, 56 year old female, a &E nurse. My haemoglobin had been taken in the RUH the day before with my notes clearly showing this and it was written that I had had problems bleeding. When you came back for the third time, I said to you firmly, I am an a and &E nurse and you have to escalate me. You then went away and I could hear you talking to someone, although I could not hear the content. You then came back and said theatre was ready and I would be collected. I would like to know what you said to the anaesthetist because whatever it was, no urgency was conveyed. Did you tell her you had an anxious patient who demanded to be escalated even though she was fine? Did you all just find it funny or tiresome? Whatever you said, it clouded the judgment of everyone in the anaesthetic room to not take me seriously. All of you on B32 just sat there at the nurses station and not one of you acted as my advocate. Not one of you took me seriously. No obs, no checking of blood loss. Every single one of you let me down. Even though theatre said they were ready, I still sat there constantly dripping for another 35 minutes. Why? I did not know it at the time, but theatre 10 was only a few yards away and any one of you could put me in a chair and pushed me there. Likewise, anyone in the anaesthetic room could have done the same, but none of you grasped what was happening because of your attitude. You, you had not identified the unfurling emergency. You were the cause and the effect followed. At this time, you were the one person who could have changed what was about to have happened and you chose not to. Was it because, as a nurse, you just knew better and you did not need a patient to tell you? Which part of I am bleeding badly did none of you comprehend? It was such a relief when the porter arrived and took me to the anaesthetic room. I thought I would be safe after I'd not been on B32. As I was pushed through the door, I said, I am bleeding badly. I was ignored and immediately realised I was not going to be safe here either. What did you say in that phone call so they just thought I was an anxious patient? I then had to endure another half hour of pure terror and went into survival mode. The anaesthetist started to put an epidural in me. I kept saying in my head, why are you doing this? You need to stop my bleeding, otherwise the epidural is pointless. I spent the whole time watching the OBS machine and trying to keep my heart rate down. All the time I was constantly dripping into the pad. No one spoke to me, no one stood up to be my advocate and there were four people in the room at all times. No one took me seriously. Finally, the anaesthetist and the ODP pushed me into theatre. They were on either side of the trolley. As we were going through the door, I said to them, have you got the blood ready? They just exchanged a glance right over me that said, anxious patient. It was awful. By then I was sitting on a river of blood over an hour and no one had checked my blood loss. I knew that as soon as I was in theatre, they would have to act quickly, but still no one believed me. I could just not believe that my colleagues were doing this to me. I was given a fentanyl, a strong painkiller which made me relaxed, but still allowed me to be completely aware. Someone put an oxygen mask on my face. I took it off and said, guys, if I never see you again, thanks for what you're about to do. How much clearer did I have to be? How many patients would have said that before an operation? The next thing I remember is my nose being really dry and pulling at a tube. Someone said, keep the oxygen on, you're in intensive care, you had a cardiac arrest. 
I was immediately wide awake. It had happened. I remember touching my sternum which felt bruised and thinking, that's what CPR feels like. I also had a central line in the right side of my neck. I had been given IV tranexamic acid, four units of blood and two units of plasma. That was not just a little loss of blood. I am writing this a year later and can still remember every single second and exact words. I know that you were aware that I'd had a cardiac arrest. When did you find out? Was it straight away from theatre staff? Did any of you have a pang of conscience? Did any of you think, oh shit, she wasn't anxious, she really did know what she was talking about? Did any of you think you were in any way partly responsible? How did it make you feel? I spent the rest of my time in hospital wide awake. No one was ever going to do this to me again. I made an official complaint to the RUH and had a phone call from the Director of Nursing who asked me to attend a meeting because it's really powerful for those involved to see and hear how it felt. I spent a long time putting questions together, together as I wanted and needed answers. Imagine my dismay when I got to the meeting and found that no one from B32 or the anaesthetic room was there. What was the point? I could not and did not get the answers I needed. I was told that you did not attend because you were a band five and would not be expected to attend. So I started the meeting knowing I'd been lied to. They had no intention of allowing me to have answers. Your banding should make no difference at all. If you are responsible enough to care for patients, you are responsible enough to complaints meeting. Was it your decision or your manager's? If I had died in theatre, the coroner would have compelled you to attend the inquest. If you had committed a crime against me, you would have had to have gone to court. Why then should you not be compelled to go to a complaints meeting? I was na naive enough to think there would be honesty at the meeting. Although your managers made a reasonable job, I just felt they were not being completely truthful. Do you know how that felt? Not just as a patient, but as a really well experienced nurse knowing that people were lying to me. I was told that you had put in your statement that the whole event took five minutes and that was simply not true. I was asked how long the event on B32 took and I said at least half an hour from the time of escalation. I asked why you had not taken me seriously and was told you had said, I looked all right. That is simply not good enough. I then asked if you would be disciplined and your matron said it was for the hospital to decide and I would not hear of the outcome. How arrogant. This was not just about me. I wanted to make sure every patient who came after me would be safe. I was so angry. This is what happens when you let someone else do the talking for you. I then asked for my medical records and had to wait for two weeks. I referred you to the NMC because I did not trust the hospital to deal with it effectively and I wanted things to be known outside of the hospital so it could not be covered up. When I got my medical records, imagine my complete disbelief when I looked at the B32 records and found that you had not written anything about the entire event. How could you possibly think that was all right? When I looked at the anaesthetic, when I looked at the anaesthetic record, the anaesthetist had also written nothing about the entire event and the pad I'd been sat on had just been thrown away without the output being recorded. This was just not right. If I had died in theatre, neither my family or the coroner would have been any the wiser and would any of you have been truthful. I then saw my electronic notes from B32, which clearly stated theatre was ready at 11.40 a.m. and I did not leave until 12.15 p.m., 35 minutes. So you had been untruthful and the evidence is clearly there. You broke all of the Section 13 rules of the Nursing Midwifery Council Code of Conduct about patient safety. I know you probably didn't have the skill set to cannulate me, but it clearly states that if things are beyond your skills, you have to escalate, and you made no effort until I insisted. I then struggled to get a second meeting to go through all the paperwork and prove the untruthfulness of the first meeting. I then had to endure five months of further treatment in the hospital, despite trying to transfer my care. Can you imagine how it felt coming in day after day to a place where I no longer felt safe or trusted anyone? The nightmares, flashbacks and disturbed nights started straight away. I had hoped that everything would settle down, 
but it was just not the event, it was the lies in the complaints meetings. After eight weeks I was suffering significantly and was referred to the hospital trauma psychologist. When I recounted the event, over one hour between the two departments, he said he had never heard someone recall a traumatic event so vividly so long after it happened. When I asked why, it been, why I was so affected by it, he said, one, because it was a late referral, secondly, because it was a preventable event, thirdly, because my colleagues had done it to me, and four, because of the lack of resolution in the complaints procedure. I am now a year on, and I want you to know that the consequences of your actions and inactions do not end on the day. This is what PTSD does. This is how it feels. I still have not had a full night's sleep, and I'm lucky to just string together four hours. Although the terror has gone, I can still recall every second of it. I kept trying to work back in A&E, but it's too stressful. Doing CPR, even in BLS updates, makes me tearful. Drawing up anaesthetic drugs makes me shaky and tearful. I have no trust in anaesthetics. And I am constantly listening out for everyone else's patient to make sure they are not deteriorating or being ignored. It's exhausting. I can do minor injuries as it's nurse-led, but I still have to be careful who I work with. My relationship with all senior colleagues that I know are involved with complaints has been destroyed because I now know what they do to patients. This is horrible because these are people who I've known and trusted and respected for a long time and it's no longer there and my nursing soul has been destroyed. I only have two emotions, anger and sadness. My anger has been out of control for months. I get little or no warning of a major attack. My language is appalling and I shout and scream and hit out at anything nearby and try to pick fights with people much bigger and stronger than me. I do risky things that I would never normally contemplate. My 22 year old relationship is in tatters. Can you imagine how hard I am to live with? A person who is usually on a very even keel and able to deal with anything, suddenly unable to cope. The only way I can keep the anger at bay is to exercise for hours at a time. On the day of my operation, I was 95 kilograms, and now I'm a tired, miserable and angry bag of bones weighing 54 kilograms. I'm still seeing the therapist regularly and he and can see no end to it. There is just no resolution because everyone chooses to give me no answers. I note that the NMC took no further action against you because you had shown remorse. You have never shown it to me. No apology, no answers to my questions. An apology from your managers is worthless because they do it because they have to. Any one of you could have come to see me on intensive care or the ward. You all had a duty of candour or did you just not feel any responsibility? My phone number is on the computer and any of you could have called and give me an explanation. This complete wall of silence just exacerbates and prolongs the agony. Everyone along the way could put me out of my misery just giving me an explanation and answers, but no one will. Everyone involved could give me peace, but you all just stand there in silence. So while you were all stood there getting support from your colleagues, your managers, your unions, the trust and the CEO, I as a patient am left to stand alone. Does that feel right? I'm still hopeful that someone involved directly or on the periphery will have the decency to honestly answer my questions. This is not going to go away and I will take this as far as I can to get answers for me but also to make sure that no other patient has to go through this. When things are not dealt with correctly, they come back to bite you. Everyone at the Royal United Hospital has had the opportunity to resolve this and give me peace, and you have all chosen not to. This I do not understand. I would like you just for a second to remember this every day, so you do not let it happen again. When you have new students or a new member of staff, Recount it to them so that when in the future a patient says they are unwell, bleeding, deteriorating, that they are dealt with swiftly and appropriately and kept safe, unlike me.